98 Not Out, sponsored by Shepherd Neen, proud supporters of cricket in Essex. Ah, yeah, Lou Bay, uh, Mumbo number five, especially for our first guest this evening. Uh, welcome along, Dean Headley. Dean, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Lovely sunny day today. <laughs> yeah, well, apart from the rain we've had, Dan, I don't know if you've had a lot of rain today. We've, we've had a bit this morning. Yeah, but we haven't had a lot for 12 weeks, so, I mean, I think it's just taking the mick that we're not playing any cricket. Yeah, well, it was always always going to happen, and you, you know that as soon as we get the green light to play... Yeah, it's going to rain. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've just played you uh, uh, Mambo Number no. 5, as you requested. Do you want to just tell us why you chose that record? I don't know, I like all sorts of music, but, you know, since this is a cricket show and going to be talking about cricket, it's just... Um, a song that sort of resonates with me because it was a time when cricket needed a bit of an injection and Channel 4 just got the rights to cricket and they chose this as and it was a massive song that year so um, I don't think he's got a lot to do with cricket but I think they got him I think they got him on the test match um, he came in and I think <laughs> it was the biggest hit of that year but it was just it's just vibrant and yeah Cricket is just before T20 started, and I think that was the start of how things were going to be presented. And suddenly, sport got a little bit trendier. Yeah, it was the summer of '99, and uh, that's when Sky Sky got it off BBC, didn't they? Um, they lost the coverage to BBC, and then uh, BBC took it off Channel Four. And then it was four, 2004 when Sky took it over. 2005, 2005 after 2006, 2006 after the 2005 after the Yeah, they lost. I think they lost the contract in 2004. And they had the 2005 season. But when when Channel Four first started, they they like you said, um, it was kind of like a precursor for T20 because they brought a lot of new things in, didn't they? Channel Four, they they did sort of uh, um, put a, a firework under it all at the time, didn't they? Yeah, I think that, I think they started the um, they started the show on the Saturday morning as well, a bit like trying to do a soccer AM and stuff like that. Yeah, and so. It was just trying to do something different, and you know they didn't last for very long. But I think some of the stuff, you know, things just got needed a little bit of an injection rather than just the same old, same old way that uh, sport had been portrayed. And cricket was lacking, and and it needed to catch up. I think you're sort of looking that way now. We were just talking about this new tournament that's going to start in South Africa, the three-team cricket. Um, sounds a bit complicated and a bit strange but um you know you've got to keep trying these things i suppose and i think that's a, that's the thing i mean we're talking about the hundred and people are going to hundred at the end of the day if you if you actually go back and you know your history of how cricket evolved you know nobody wanted world series cricket nobody wanted t20 mm. cricket nobody wanted the sunday league when it first came in you know 40 over cricket was such a re- revelation and and my, my dad was um you know was playing in um when they first introduced it, and actually the reactions of the players were, oh, this is a bit of joke cricket. Then suddenly it became not so joke after about three years, and T20 was the same. Suddenly people realised, well, this isn't just a, a slogathon. This is, you know, there's tactics to this, and what are the tactics, and we're going to try and win this. And, and I think anything in cricket that comes in is always deemed as this is not right, and then it becomes right. I'm just looking back at your career um, and your county career, and I'm just noticing that uh, so the two main counties you played with, uh, well, Middlesex uh, and Kent, I've just sort of picked out those two. Um, yep. You played with some real legends. I'm just looking at the Middlesex team. So contemporaries of yours at Middlesex, Mike Gatting, uh, Mark Rambercrash, John Embury, Phil Tufnell, Angus Fraser, Desmond Haynes, and then at Kent, Carl Hooper, Aravinda De Silva, Andrew Simons, Mark Elam, uh, Alan Eagleston, Min Patel, Martin McCaig. Um, what was it like playing with those guys? And, and was there a difference between those two sides? Uh, Kent, I mean, we, 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 we won, uh, I think, one thing. Uh, but we got to, we were, we were the bridesmaids all the time. <laughs> uh, at Middlesex, it was very different. But the county cricket was different then. Mm. Um you know, I'm not going to go on as an old old player and go on, but you 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 had all the England players playing. Yeah. But also every overseas player that played was the best. Mm. And those counties who took a bit of a risk playing, you know, maybe an up and coming overseas player, you know, sometimes got a little bit stung. Um, you know, you had the Ambroses, the Am- Ambrose Walsh. Um, 
you, you just you, you had to be a world superstar to get a gig like that and now because of the T20 cricket going around the world counties having to sign people for a month or whatever whereas I was lucky enough to play near where when you had a player you had the whole year to get to know him as a person talk cricket with him learn from him and, and go on from there Were dressing rooms a bit different back in those days to what they are now do you think? Sorry? Were dressing rooms a bit different to what they are these days? <laughs> now you know it is <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the first thing, <laughs> how can I put this? So you, your first thing that you did in the morning was fill out your drinks list of what you <laughs> wanted as a team afterwards. Unless you played at Leicester, who just gave you six guns of lager and six guns of bitter. Um, <laughs> but most counties allowed you to pick one drink and, you know, Carl Hooper would have a rum and coke, I might have a Jack Daniels. Um, and it wasn't that we were unprofessional, it's just how it was in those days. Yeah. and. And, you know, if I'd done a day of bowling, there's nothing wrong with me having a pint. That, mm. That's how we thought. And we, some people would call it unprofessional today, but um, I'm sure there's a few carbs in those lagers um, <laughs> that would help you. Um, but, yeah, it, it was... Um, there was uh, it's very difficult to say with the difference because I haven't been in the dressing room today, but I'm, I'm sure that there, people hung around the dressing room for a lot longer. Uh, I, I you think see it in club level um, dressing rooms disappear. Maybe you know, maybe that's a, you know they've got more things to do these days, and we had less things to do. But spoke a lot of cricket, immersed ourselves in it, and I'm sure they do at times. But it seems to be more structured today, so they'll have a team meeting. Whereas we just used to chat cricket all the time. Um, Did it get a bit heated? Yeah, yeah, it did get heated, yeah, especially in the middle six change room. Um, some strong harsh characters. environment, uh, honest environment, um, but actually n- nobody sort of uh, came in the next day and said, oh, he said that to me, we weren't babies. Mm. Um, probably the, the people would have a little bit of a heart attack today if, if dressing rooms behaved as harshly as the middle six change room did, but people accepted it. You know, you... you um, you had to be strong to survive, um, and it was honest. And and I think sometimes, you know, the best teams are honest. Uh, I watched the Jordan the Jordan series about the Bulls, Chicago Bulls, and oh, yeah. blimey, that's brutal, you know. And and that's the same thing with the middle six game. You know? I mean, I think I walked on my debut. I think I played with nine internationals. <laughs> wow. um, and up until that time, I'd never played a first class game, and um, I played the MCC with the county champions on the opening day, so the other team was full of internationals as well. So, tough debut. Dean, I know you, you coach now. Um, is that something that's changed quite a lot in the way that coaches now have to sort of look at players' mentality as much as what they can and can't do on the pitch? Because, as you mentioned there, you, you, it was very tough, whereas nowadays it seems to be that there's more in there for players and how they perform and the mental side of it. Oh, there is. I think it's always been the case that you, you've had to... I think they've got more access to everything. They've got more access to all sorts of video equipment, analysing your technique, what you're doing. Um, I mean, when I went on tour with England, we took four or five people with us. Uh, now they take 17, 18 people. The, the actual sideline people are more than the actual people on tour. So um, I'm, sure, I'm sure they do, and why wouldn't they? Um, we know certain things about our best players we know how they react and the more that we can understand about how they react under pressure the more chance we're going to perform under pressure you mentioned england there um i wanted to ask uh about two of your england tours um both of them overseas so the first one and i think when you mentioned the name dean headley to cricket fans the 6 for 60 at the MCG in 1998 is the first thing that springs to people's minds. And we had Alex Tudor on recently, who was also on that, uh, on that tour. Um, what is it like taking 6 for 60 at the MCG? That must have been mad. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, to be fair, they outplayed us for 80% of the game. So, um, you know, we played... We, we, we fought with everything was going... You know, it's not easy to in Australia. You play the whole country. 
everybody bags you. It's all, all a bit of banter, so, you know, but it is easy for for that tour to get on top of you. But I've always enjoyed playing against Australia. I've done pretty well against them. Um, I enjoyed the whole country, took it for what it was. Um, and, you know, Mark Rampakash's catch at, at off um, oh, yeah. Langer, uh, Malali was bowling he took a great catch and suddenly we got on a roll I think it's a combination of Australia thinking they'd already won the game there's a story of Slater say, um, saying that, oh, shall I get the champagne out and I think Tubby Taylor went mad at him and they lost the game and we took that momentum into the, into the Sydney Test match but it's tough cricket you know the wickets are very different there's not many English bowlers who bowl particularly well in Australia so it just suited me. Um, I enjoyed playing on those sorts of wickets. Um, the ball reversed. I didn't mind bowling with a kookaburra. Um, enjoyed it. Loved touring. Um, <laughs> the camaraderie, the fun. There is a, there is a massive fun element of it. Not sure, so sure today. I, I think camera I think phones might have ruined that. But um, certainly, I loved touring Australia. It was um, a privilege. And I went on an England 18 tour before that, so I knew where I was going in most cities. So, staying with 1998, um, the West Indies tour. Now, this was a notorious tour. Um, the first test at Sabina Park was abandoned after 10 overs with that pitch breaking up. Um, and then um, Barbados, I was at the Barbados test, uh, and that was quite a, a, a lively atmosphere. Then... Um, it was Antigua and rain, and and just tell us about your memories of that series because it was it just seemed to be non-stop, um, just action on and off the pitch, really. Yeah, so so basically, what happened was we played play at Sabana Park, bad test match, uh, bad pitch gets cancelled. You know, we're wondering is there going to be a riot because it was in Jamaica, uh, cancelled tour. Now, obviously, that was probably, you know, the the start of the end of the West Indies yeah. the West Indies team so it was a very good team that they put out um, you know England hadn't beaten them stuff like that so it was always going to be a tough tour we go out there game gets called off we're thinking okay now it's down to a four match series and then the ECB agreed to play back to back yeah. test match in Trinidad and That's you're right, thinking yeah. well if you really want to win the series you want the shorter contest we go to Trinidad, lose the first test match. I didn't bowl very well, got criticised by Bumble. Um, put my hands up. He was coach. Got picked for the second test match. We did well. We won that. Close game again. It was a nip and tuck series. Then we go to Barbados, play really well. Um, massive atmosphere. They yeah. pick Lambert and Philo Wallace. They open up like it's a one-day game. But we, we help them by the, the sort of... Um, the attacking fields that were set in so it was very passionate and the old ground in the West Indies you know it's like the cricket atmosphere is right yeah. on top of you so fantastic place to play proper Calypso cricket that's gone these and days, we go it? out there and to be honest we had them in a good position we had them in a good position to win the game and then the rain came for the last day move on to Antigua the covers leaked on the first day and then we lose the toss we get put in and we the game shouldn't have started on that first day because the wicket was wet, the wicket was soft, and then Ambrose and Walsh are a nightmare on wickets like that. So we're five down on that night time. Game done then. Absolutely done. Next day, they clean us up. Lunchtime, sun's come out. Wicket's baked up a little bit. And um, the wicket becomes flat. They score. God knows how many they scored. It was like too many. And, and that was it then. Um, and then we just we just struggled. Um, I forgot the, the the guy in the test match in between, but you know they beat us. We should have made it two two all at, at Barbados. And again, it was just a bit of misfortune. But again, fantastic support. You know, probably one of the last tours where there was huge amount of West Indian presence. Yeah. Um, the old grounds. I remember the Antigua Rec ground. I mean, blimey, what an atmosphere that was! I'm sure the stand was shaking <laughs> as they're singing and they're passing the rum around with gravy, gravy there and, and the drums. And David Rudd who was in the in the stands and he was he was DJing from the stands and it was just <laughs> unbelievable. 
I remember being at Barbados uh, for that, g- and it was, it was as you say, it was almost like the end of an era in many ways. Um, the, the the West Indian team, the crowd was probably two thirds West Indies and then a third of the Barmy Army, which was in its kind of like early days back then. And and I was sat in a temporary stand which was above the sound system, which didn't seem to stop all day and. Huge speakers belting out all these songs, and, and they're passing and they're passing the room around to yeah. all the supporters <laughs> and everything like that. But you know, I mean, that's the one thing I forgot. My two tours. I mean, the Barmy Army were unbelievable. Mm. I mean, what a set of what a set of supporters they are. I mean, you can't underestimate how important they are to England touring. Dean, I've got to ask that first test with the, the wicket as it was. What was there any conversation in the dressing room, or was it just everybody staring, wondering what is going on here? What in Jamaica? Mm. Uh, the, the, the first test at Sabina yeah. when it got abandoned. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a few eyes that got like the eyeballs got a little bit wider, thinking we might have to bat on that. I think Phil Tufnell was underneath the bench. <laughs> he was just peeping. <laughs> it's like being in the war in the tw- well. I imagine it being a bit like the war in the trenches where you're going. I ain't going over that thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was. Um, Did you get a tough. sniff of it before the game started? Did you get a well, sense? Well, you couldn't. Was... You couldn't really tell. But actually, when you look back now, you know when you put, you know when a groundsman puts a string from, you know, it is a method they used years ago. They used to put the string down the side of the pitch, yeah. and it went from one crease to the next, and it was a way of lining up the creases, everything like that. And in some cases, in some places, the the actual string was touching the pitch. Oh, and then, like a yard later, it was like an inch below the, the an inch below the line. So it was like it was like a long corrugated pitch. So it was like <laughs> moguls, uh-huh. but you couldn't really see it because of the shine of the pitch. It was only when we started playing that we thought, "Oh, blimey, this is like." dangerous and it was it wasn't us actually it was the umpires who came the umpires came and 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 started chatting to uh, skip and just saying look this is this is not good I'm and so pi- it, it was all came from the umpires everybody thinks it came from our players but no it was the umpires that started questioning the pitch was it at athers wasn't he was it atherton or stewart was the captain at the time Atherton was captain at the start of that yeah. series, wasn't he? Um, did he? Did he? Re- did he resign halfway th- or after the? Yeah, he did. He resigned after yeah. we lost to Antigua. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I loved playing under Athers, and and then Stewie took over, and I would have loved to have had an extent. Well, I didn't really get the chance to play under Nas, but I, I, I would have liked that. Yeah. Now, listen. Bringing this right up to date, bang up to date. Um, I was watching a very, very interesting podcast, uh, the PCA Zoomcast, to give it its correct title, last night. I'll put the link on our 98 Not Out Facebook page. I recommend everybody goes and has a look about this and thinks about what's what's being said. Um, it was Ian Ward, and um, he was um, had a panel, which I thought was an excellent panel, Michael Carberry, Isha Guha, Mark Butcher and yourself and um, you were discussing basically um, and, and this was something we've been talking about on this show as well that the lack of uh, black players or minority players that are coming through in the game at the moment and would you just like to expand on some of the things that you were talking about last night? Well for me the biggest issue with, with all age group cricket not just trying to get um, you know um, ethnic minorities playing and stuff like that is um, the cost of cricket so when I was a kid I didn't pay for county training I'd probably put a little bit in for tea money you weren't, you weren't made to buy a load of kit um, it, it, it's just that if, you, if you're looking for talent you've got to be able to just give that talent free so when you, when you go for rugby and pay for, to go for rugby um, training with Tigers or anything like that when you go to football, you, all you got to do is get there. You don't pay for it, but cricket has this system where everybody's paying to be in county cricket age groups. And and be, before that, then you've also got to be fair that when you're looking at areas and people say, well, you know, we don't get any people playing cricket in Tower Hamlets, you've got to say, well, there's no cricket grounds in Tower Hamlets. Yeah. And you can't just... It, it's really easy to say there's no black players playing, but at the end of the day... You know, 
is cricket is cricket really you know are there places to play in inner, inner city London you know Birmingham and stuff like that probably more so in Birmingham but um, and also it's really hard when your role models in the game are disappearing and the role models that they see are a lot of footballers so yeah. if you take if you take when Roland Butcher first got into the England team as the first black player and then you look at well I'm going to say Laurie Cunningham who was the first yeah. England under 23 player so he's the first black player to pull on a football shirt all happened around about the same time but the explosion has gone in football but the explosion isn't there as cricket it's actually tailed off mm. now is that cricket's fault I'm not sure whether it's all cricket it's no, all, exactly. uh, cricket's fault because I just think it's a lot easier to go and get a football and play football yeah. You can play in cages, you can play in parks, you can play anywhere. Whereas in cricket, it's not that easy to be able to go and get the equipment, play hardball and get good at it. I think that's a fair point. I think I'm just sort of thinking back to when I was sort of a, a young lad and it was always easy to get a game of football. I mean, that's another thing, that kids don't go out and play like we used to. Um, I mean, school holidays or after school, we'd be down the local green and there'd be a kickabout and... Um, or just the amount of traffic on the roads you used to play in the streets. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure that kids have that kind of culture these days of just going outside. And well, there's a fearfulness, especially well, in inner, inner cities, isn't there, with yeah. gangs and stuff like that. So it, it, it is a... I don't want to say it's a class thing, but is it, is it in a sense, it is a privilege of those with money, or those that can afford it seem to be able to play, but... There's just a lack of clubs and everything in, in the sort of cities, isn't there? There, there is, and, and club cricket's under pressure because lots of clubs are folding. Um, they, they're either amalgamating or folding. And so the ECB do have to pull their finger out. And it's not just about getting black players playing, Asian players or whatever. It's getting young kids playing into club cricket. If you ask me, you can talk about schools and everything, private schools, but the key to our cricket is always being club cricket. Yeah. So private school cricket is an icing on the cake. But uh, we still need our club cricket to be strong and they've got to look at the structures and the travel and the way that our club cricket is structured and that's going to be the key as to whether we can hold and get as many kids playing cricket. Do you think, we were just before you came on air, we were just talking about you know the necessity of getting a cricket season started, particularly for, for the, as you mentioned, for the clubs because it's so important and we... If, if we start having clubs folding or disappearing, then the lifeblood for everything above it is going gonna, is gonna to struggle then, isn't it? Yeah, but it's not just now. I mean, I'm, I'm quite opinionated on this. Um, club cricket's been struggling for a long time. It's been ignored. And I'd, I'd like the ECB to really take hold of it and say, this is how we're going to structure it. This is what we're going to do. And also, the first-class counties and the minor counties have to take charge of club cricket. Like in every other country, if you go to Australia, you know, the state run the cricket. Mm. It's not left to some sort of committee on some sort of league to decide the rules, what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. You know, it's, it's run from the top down. And every league in Australia is told what to do. Um, you know, the states, they, they share best practice. They decide what they're going to do, what works in one state. Once that works, they look at, they, they try and pass on that knowledge. So... In, in Australia, cricket is definitely run from the top down, whereas here, you know, we talk about grassroots, we talk, yeah, I'm sure that the ECB do support club cricket, but they don't control it. And I think now, promotion, I'm not a big fan of promotion and relegation, I think it fractures cricket, it's, been, it's, it's made club cricket into a money market, instead of saying, well, do you know what, we are at this level, we know what we are, our job is to introduce people to the game and get them on. So if they come to our club, they get better for us than our standard, we'll pass them on to the next standard and be proud of it. Whereas we've, we've taught cricket clubs to be taught to be not, not ambitious. You can be, still be ambitious, but it's the be on and end all. You know, it is. Where does our first team play? Well, actually, you've got a second team and a third team in your club, and there's not a lot of connection between all three teams. Because they all play in three different structures. Whereas when I was growing up, you know, if you're in the Birmingham League, your first, seconds and thirds were in the Birmingham League. There was no promotion and relegation, but you had promotion between the teams each week in your own club. But the standard was close-knit. Everybody knew what the standard of that league was. 
you didn't want it, weren't up to that standard, you went to the next standard. And you knew exactly what that next standard was. At the moment, my son, 13, can go and play cricket in any league and happen to come up against an overseas player because the chairman has decided he wants to take his, his, his cricket t- club from Division 8, that's not a great standard, mm. all the way through. But in the meantime, he's hired an overseas player to devastate who he's playing in front of, which for me is dangerous to young cricketers. Yeah, it's going to destroy their morale and interest, isn't it? Cause it oh, it's just, there, there is too much differentiation between club cricket at the moment within leagues. So you're meant to know what standard you're going to. So, you know, if you want an overseas player, have it, but you've got to be in the top league in the area. So at least people know, if I go and play in that, that's what I'm going to get. But they shouldn't be playing six, seven leagues below. And then you've got the English players as well, who are now taking money and playing six six leagues below what they're meant to be playing because somebody's given them under pound in their back pocket. Yeah, yeah. We've seen that out this way firsthand of... Uh uh, of, of you know the, the kind of money's being paid to get certain players on, uh, and it's uh, yeah, it's not good. I, and what do you win? <laughs> don't win anything. No, you don't. It's not as if you're investing and you're going to build a stadium. Um, and so it's a little bit of a full full storm where people said promotion relegation was going to lift the standard. It's actually weakened the standard because it spread all the best players across too many leagues. And it's not sustainable at all. And that's the other thing, isn't it? Um, right, Dean, thank you so much for coming on. We could talk all night, and maybe we'll have to get you back at another point, or, or when things are better, get, even get you in the studio, and uh, we can we can explore these things. But I would urge people to, to follow Dean on Twitter, um, but to look at this discussion that went on last night, because it was really interesting, and as we were just saying beforehand, it was quite an angry Michael Carberry as well, um, taking part in that discussion, but some lo- lots of interesting points made. Um, thank you so much for joining us and uh, thank you for Mambo Number 5 as well enjoyed listening to that after a long time yeah it uh, got me got my fingers clicking that did <laughs> right well thanks a lot Dean all, all the best for the future and uh, hopefully all of us can be outside enjoying some cricket in the not too distant future yes in this wonderful sunshine absolutely take care ok thanks, thanks a lot, lot. bye